Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spect imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warriors Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. And stay tuned for a special code for a discount to Amen Clinics for a full evaluation, as well as any of our supplements at brainmdhealth.com. Welcome. We are so glad you're here, and we have a special treat. So this is Dr. Jennifer Farrell Week, uh, where we're going to talk about substance abuse yeah. in its all forms, uh, and not just, I guess, substances. We're also going to talk about social media mm -hmm. and gadgets. Addictions. We're going to talk yeah. about addictions. Dr. Farrell is one of the addictionologists here at Amen Clinics. You've been with us how long? Almost eight years. Almost eight years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I have loved every minute of it to have her with us. Uh, she's a board certified psychiatrist. She's also um, certified in addiction medicine. She has seen lots of complex people. Mm -hmm. and We specialize in complex here. <laughs> we specialize in complexity. Um, and you want to listen to this, even if you've never had an addiction, because odds are either you struggled at some point or someone you love has struggled. Mm -hmm. It is just so common. Addictions affect nearly 20% of the population at some point and, in their life. And even more people where they may not meet criteria for substance use disorder may have periods of life where they find themselves abusing substances or binging in substances, or they may kind of be approaching that cutoff where they're getting into impaired functioning. So it really is important for everyone to have a good working understanding of addictions for parents who have kids who are growing up, what to watch with their teenagers when they go away to college, um, so I think it really affects everyone. So how did you get involved in this field? What turned this into a passion for you? You know, it's so interesting. You know, I always say no one goes to kindergarten and, and says, when I grew up, I want to treat heroin addicts. You know? <laughs> it's just not something that, that we're kind of programmed to think about. And you know, you've been through medical school and you do all your rotations, you do surgery, you do everything. And the patient population that people like working with the least is people with addictions. They miss their appointments. They never do what you say. It's very frustrating to students who are in training because they want to see that what they're doing works. And we aren't yeah, really... Yeah, we like it when people get better. Right. But we aren't really given the tools in medical school to know how to work with this patient population. When I um, was about halfway through my psychiatry um, residency, I was realizing that in my area, half to maybe 70% of my patients had a current or past addiction issue. So I started playing around with the idea of, well, what would happen if I did a fellowship and you know, learned more about this? Would this help me in my outpatient practice? And during that time, there was actually an article in the local newspaper um, about an OBGYN in the area. I was living in Honolulu at the time. Uh, and she well, was trying to... <laughs> well, if you have to do an internship <laughs> and residency somewhere, might as well be Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> um, but she was trying to open a clinic for pregnant drug addicts, and she was working on funding for that. So I literally cut the article out of the paper, took it into the head of the department, and I said, I will stay an extra year and do this fellowship. It was in addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine. And I handed him this, and I said, if I can do this. And he said, it's impossible. She's not um, yet board certified in addictions. There's no one there to supervise you. And as you know, in a fellowship, you need supervision. So I just took a deep breath and smiled, and I said, you can. <laughs> He went, oh, crap, fine. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up agreeing to do the fellowship. I called her up. I said, 
can I come? And she said, please. And so as she was developing her program, I was developing the addiction treatment component. It just felt something like it just something went off in my brain that there's more than just treating my patients who have addictions, how far reaching addictions is. And women can't just automatically shut off their addictions just because they get pregnant. So how do we treat them? And so that's how it started for me. Wow, what a great story. Let's talk about co-occurring conditions mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. often substance abuse is caused by mm -hmm. um, having other mental health issues like mm -hmm. ADD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Um, and sometimes the substance abuse causes the other mental health issues. I was with somebody yesterday and he said he started doing mushrooms when mm -hmm. he was a teenager. And it was after a bad trip that negativity came and visited him and has never left mm -hmm. since then. He's 45. So he, before that time, had been confident mm -hmm. and um, positive. And he just said he saw hell. And now mm. it was sort of always with him. Yeah. So when you think of, we, we call it dual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. talk, talk to me about that. What goes through your mind? So at some point, not on the initial visit necessarily, but at some point we have to answer that question of what comes first. Is this an underlying issue that the person was then trying to throw alcohol at or cannabis or something to try to fix this underlying issue? A patient I saw earlier today had that. Or is this someone who started abusing substances that led into some other issues, heavier use, and then over time they develop the insomnia? the depression, the anxiety, or in some cases, psychotic symptoms. Um, and as you know, psychosis is just a word that means break with reality. So some people will start hearing voices when the person next to them wouldn't hear that, um, or having some paranoia or delusions. Um, and we can see that with a lot of substances, even with cannabis, with the stimulants, with amphetamines, with methamphetamines. So some people can present looking like they have schizophrenia, and you have to figure out, is this someone who was genetically predisposed to having schizophrenia or is this substance induced and that's tricky so for me mm -hmm. I often because um, I'm also a child psychiatrist is I want to know well what were they like when they were four and mm -hmm. what did their teachers say about them and what was going on with them before any mm -hmm. substance mm -hmm. abuse because people have ADD for example they don't start with symptoms when they're 40. They right. have symptoms generally when they're, when they're, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. Teachers will say, you should have tried harder, you talk too much, uh, uh, class clown, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And according to one study from Harvard, 52% of untreated uh, people with ADD end up abusing drugs and alcohol. Right. Um, so, so that would be so it's history before right the problem that we have is a lot of the psychiatric problems um, have their age of onset between 18 and 24 big life changes graduating high school going to college joining the military so a lot of times if someone is genetically predisposed to having let's say an anxiety disorder it doesn't come out until that age range well if they start at the end of high school or during college drinking or using cannabis or other substances it's hard to tell whether there's this underlying predisposition versus a substance induced so as an addictionologist, how do you decide? Well, I tell my patients I kind of look at, at treatment in three phases. One, what is a fire we need to put out today? What do we need to do to get control over life today? Then I say, okay, what's our short-term plan going to be? And then we look at a longer-term plan. Um, and so the first thing I do if someone's hearing voices, I have to treat that. The longer the the, the longer the amount of time that the brain spends um, hearing voices, the more likely that's going to continue. So I have to get that under control. Does that mean that person's going to be on medication the rest of his life? 
Absolutely not. Um, but I need to get that under control. Then we need to, once we have some stabilization, start digging in and seeing what these other issues are. Um, and sometimes we can tell and sometimes we can't. But we really have to treat the symptoms and improve the quality of life. So let's take an anxiety disorder, mm -hmm. for example, because so many of our patients come to us um, on benzos mm -hmm. and marijuana. Um, what's your approach to someone who's really anxious and mm -hmm. using substances at the same time? So one, we have to put out the fire. So what are the safety issues we have to look at? Because stopping suddenly sedatives for some people can be deadly, can cause seizures. If people are on high doses of Xanax, for instance, and they stop suddenly, they can have seizures or even die in withdrawal. So we have to look at that. But then we have to, if we don't address that anxiety component, um, then they're just going to go back on those substances. Right, because they feel awful. So there's actually a lot of data looking at medications that can be a good kind of bridge between getting off of those benzodiazepines or those sedatives and figuring out what the underlying cause is using anticonvulsants. Uh, the anticonvulsants such as gabapentin bind to the same receptor as those uh, sedatives, um, but they, it's not, it doesn't have the same addictive pathway. Right, um, nobody robs the 7-Eleven to get Neurontin. Right. Or gabapentin, which right. is the generic name. They, they do for OxyContin. They do for OxyContin. <laughs> but they don't yes, for they gabapentin. Do. <laughs> um, and, and it actually can be abused. Uh, anything can be abused these days. And so there's articles on trends of, of people, you know, does gabapentin have a street value? And it does. But for the most part, um, it's much safer to use and it is Xanax. And I think I've used it for 20 years, ever since it came out. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of one case and I'm different than a lot of psychiatrists, I push the dose. Mm -hmm. Like I'll go up to 5,000 milligrams because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll drug this brain into submission <laughs> and do a better job, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully a less toxic job. And I really like it for my anxious, irritable mm -hmm. patients. Exactly. It really tends to help. It targets that my... angst that people get. It's like when the anxiety comes with a level of discomfort where people feel like they're going to crawl out of their skin. It's really good with that and helps restore sleep. So we use that a lot um, to bridge the gap. Um, but it gets down to the question of what is this anxiety about? Is this a generalized anxiety? Has there been trauma? We talk a lot about trauma in addictions. About 90% of women who present for treatment for substance use disorder have some kind of either PTSD or some kind of traumatic experience. The numbers are a little bit lower for men, but I think it's largely because it goes unreported. Um, so we have to look if the anxiety comes from trauma, then I need to address it and I'm going to have a different approach than if the anxiety is based on a phobia of getting into an elevator. Um, so I have to see what that anxiety is related to. We need, we need to build the coping strategies for dealing with it um, and then come up with our longer term strategies of being able to come off of medication. Um, we want to treat it with a non-medication way, um, but that transition of getting off the substances and learning the new coping strategies is key. And that's where the scans can be so helpful mm -hmm. that if, for example, we see the diamond pattern in the scan, which their emotional brain is just lit up. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean they have PTSD, but it means we should ask about trauma. And I don't know if you've had mm -hmm. the same experience that I've had. You know, we ask them about it during our history. They say, no, mm -hmm. we see the diamond pattern. We go, are you sure? Um, have you ever been robbed, raped in a fire? And the number of people who say no, that then say yes, and mm -hmm. we'll tell you about a rape or, um, living in the house of an alcoholic father or an alcoholic yes. mother. Well, which you is just hit trauma. it exactly because people think of trauma as I was in the bank during the robbery and they don't understand that having a really chaotic household 
in childhood is emotionally traumatic for kids. And these things actually count. Um, I saw someone today who grew up with alcoholic parents and his parents divorced when he was very young and he just never felt safe. And he internalized all of that um, drama around him and came out with this belief that there's something wrong with me. And that's what kids do because kids only know that adults are in charge of the world and they, the kid's brain expects this adult brain to provide a sense of structure and order in that environment. And when instead there's chaos, the child goes, well, if adults are in charge and things aren't going very well, I must be doing something wrong. I'm not good enough. I'm not whatever. It's not a thought they have. It's a belief that develops because kids don't have this higher order thinking. And so what happened with this patient I saw today is he started getting bullied. He never felt like he fit in going back to the time of the, the divorce. And he started just drowning himself in substances when he was in high school. In every treatment program he's been to for the last 10 years, he's only been able to maintain 10 months of sobriety at one time because every treatment program only looks at the substance use and no one has talked to him about this hole, this pit, this belief that he doesn't fit in that there's something innately wrong with him. And that's what he's trying to fix with the substance use. So you have to get in there and see what's actually there so we can address it. That's what's gonna make him successful with his substance use treatment. And he was a diamond pattern. So when we think of treating dual diagnosis or people have an addiction plus another mental health issue, here at Amen Clinics, the method is what we always try to assess and treat people in the four circles. So what's the underlying biology? Mm -hmm. He had the trauma pattern. Um, what's your genetics? Was there head trauma? Is there an infection? Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of other environmental toxin? Um, but also what are the psychological issues? What mm -hmm. did you grow up in? What are the messages you tell yourself? The social issues are huge in addiction, right? You become like the people you hang out with. Right. It's so powerful. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a new study where if you hold your partner's hand, um, their brain actually begins to sink with your brainwave pattern. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful whose hand you hold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you become like the people you hang mm -hmm. out with. And then there's the spiritual circle, which is why the heck do you care? Mm -hmm. Why are you on the planet? What's your sense of meaning and That's purpose? one of my favorite parts to get into. And you know, we always have to put out the fires first and get to the medical stuff and the toxic exposures. But sitting down with someone and figuring out who am I? What is my place in this world? What kind of person do I want to be? What are my values? How do I want to live my life? Do I want to have a family? How do I want to raise my kids? It's fun and exciting. I tell every patient who walks through the door here, um, my goal for everyone is to improve your quality of life. And so we want to think about as we go through all of these four circles, what is it we're actually going to implement that's going to improve life on a day-to-day -day basis? So stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about what has become one of the most addictive things in our society, social media. Oh my goodness. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, I am here with Dr. Jennifer Farrell, who's board certified in psychiatry, addiction psychiatry, um, a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Um, she attended Loma Linda University School of Medicine, which is where Tana went and mm -hmm. got her nursing degree. She's an award-winning researcher, international speaker, interested in the interface between cultural and spiritual factors and overall mental health. Um, and today we're going to talk about something that is just so horrifying to me. Um, it's just, everyone's favorite topic. It's, <laughs> it's, it's everyone's new favorite. It's the addiction of 
the decade, if you will, mm -hmm. which is Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Twitter and, and all social media. It's social media that has really mm -hmm. stolen our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, according to a study from Microsoft, this is 2015, the human attention span is now eight seconds. Mm -hmm. A goldfish is nine seconds. So I say this is evolution going the wrong way. Well, I, I have a feeling it's not going to be too much more time before we actually have to reassess how we diagnose attention issues because there is such a huge difference between these fast-paced video games and this online scrolling through and news and everything on an instant and going and sitting in a classroom. People get bored. They can't pay attention. And... Is it actually, you know, ADD, the classic ADD, or are people now so used to having so much information at such a fast pace that they can no longer pay attention? Um, and the world has changed, certainly since mm -hmm. I grew up, uh, since you grew up. You know, when yeah. we were kids, there was not the constant bombardment. I remember when video games came into my house, my son was... Um, 11 and he'd gotten straight A's in sixth grade and began to fall apart in seventh grade mm -hmm. and we started fighting I think it was an Atari video game we started <laughs> fighting about it and so I just took it out of the house I could just see the writing on the wall this is a bad thing mm -hmm. and he's like where'd it go I said oh it's not working anymore he said well aren't you gonna get it fixed I'm like no it's not good for you let's go play basketball mm -hmm. <laughs> So let's talk about the biology of this. So I've been thinking a lot about it, that deep in your brain, you have structures that produce a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Mm -hmm. So it's in this area by your brainstem called the ventral tegmental area. Mm -hmm. It goes and pushes on the pleasure centers of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, part of the basal ganglia. And so dopamine is produced. It pushes on the pleasure center. And if it's released too much, too often, the pleasure centers actually begin to wear out. Mm -hmm. And so people who are obese, they actually have lower activity in their nucleus accumbens because all of the um, low quality but tasty food mm -hmm. has worn out their pleasure centers. Mm -hmm. And so they have to do more and more to get the mm -hmm. same result. It certainly happens with cocaine. Mm -hmm. It happens with methamphetamines. And they've actually found it happens with social media. Mm -hmm. When you're waiting for the next post, for the next fan, for the next email, the next mm -hmm. text, um, it's like you get this dopamine drip, 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 dump, mm -hmm. drip, 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 dump, and you begin to chase it. Does that make sense from an addiction standpoint? Well, absolutely. And when we look at different types of reward, um, the patterns of reward behaviors have been studied. And there's consistent reward, where every time you push a button, you get a pellet of food. Um, and then there's inconsistent reward. And this is why gambling is such an issue, because when you push a button and get a reward every time, people push a button and get the award. When you push a button and don't get anything, push a button, don't get anything, push a button and then randomly get a lot of stuff, then you want to keep pushing that button. And people actually will push it more and more and more when they don't have consistent output or input. Um, and so that's really how social media works. When you're on Facebook, well, is someone going to like something? And did I, was I clever? Did they think it was funny? Did they like my picture? You know, and you never, a, a lot of times people are going on there to see their feedback, their feedback. Are people retweeting what I said? Was I clever? Um, and so they're looking to get that, but it's not every time they log on. So they want to log on again and again and again, and looking for that feedback. So it's creating an addiction. Do you think these companies actually hire neuroscientists to figure out how the brain works? You know, it's interesting. I wouldn't be surprised to know. I don't know the inner workings of them. Um, knowing what we know about the food company and our food industry and, and how often they brought in experts and they started uh, putting sugar in everything, like every processed food product in a can, in a jar, you know, it's hard to find one without sugar. And they did that because they knew how addicting 
sugar can be. And so the food industry learned it long ago, and I'm not surprised at all if the gaming industry, um, the social media industry does exactly the same thing. So I actually asked you knowing the answer to the question. <laughs> Did I get it right? Absolutely. <laughs> higher neuroscientist. There's a book on this. It's called Hooked. And it's how to develop addictive products. Hmm. And now we heard recently Facebook's going after your children. They developed an app for children. Oh, I, and I did hear that. I was just horrified because it reminds me of McDonald's and Ronald mm -hmm. McDonald. What is Ronald McDonald? The about? Happy Meals. Going and all after the toys your children. And, yeah. and, you know, we need. The Brain Warrior's Way needs to go after them, but in a healthy way. Is this good for my brain or mm -hmm. bad for it? So I recently had a 13-year-old patient who um, took pictures of her body that she probably shouldn't have and shared it privately. And that person she trusted shared it publicly. And my patient became suicidal, wanted to run away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just... A nightmare. And I was actually in Washington, D.C. at the time, and Chloe, our 14 year old, was with me. And I went, Chloe, how often does this happen? And I'm like thinking 5% of the time. She goes, 30% of the kids do that. And I was just horrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I say to my friends all the time, like, thank God we didn't have Facebook when we were younger because we had a break. You know, we all went to school with the mean girls or, you know, all this stuff could happen between 8 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. <laughs> and then you went home and you played with the kids on your street and did your homework and everything. And the the teasing could stop. You could have a break from that. And there wasn't this kind of idea of long lasting ramifications. There could be gossip but there certainly weren't photos. And so we you know, talk all the time about how grateful we are that we didn't have that. I can't imagine the pressures that kids have growing up right now with all the Instagram, not only of what to post, who's looking at it, but in a sense, it tells them how to look. And so they're really caught up in body image and the feedback that they're getting. And so, I mean, it's really something that this generation is looking at that I think older generations didn't have to deal with at the same rate and constant input with that. So thinking about it from an addictionologist's perspective, what is the best way for parents to deal with gadgets for their kids? And we didn't talk about it yet, but pornography is also a huge issue. And I mean, it's just horrifying to me. I have another 14 year old patient and it's in his room for hours at a time talking mm -hmm. to his friends about the porn they're watching on their phones, which is shrinking his brain, right? right. I mean, it's dumping dopamine mm -hmm. repeatedly. So it's going to take more and more. So you imagine it's going to really damage his intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And uh, the parents were sort of beside themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, two words, right? Parental locks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can call a phone company, you can call your cable company, you can block these sites. And it, it's something that even parents who aren't talking to their kids about it yet, your kid's getting 12, 13, 14, it's a good idea just to go ahead and do it. Um, because kids, you know, even before they have sex education in school or around that time, they're not going to come to you as the parent and be like, oh, I have these questions. Right. How they're many of go, us would have gone to our mom and dad never. and say, hey, this is never. happening. What do you think? Never. And so <laughs> to have those in place. My mom has seven children. And whenever I'd bring it up, she'd turn green. And I would like, <laughs> I know you know about it. <laughs> Yeah. So, so limiting access is key. Having the conversations with kids about sexuality and healthy sexuality and how damaging pornography can be. So pornography isn't really learning about sex ed. Um, there's a big difference there. So a lot of times people just say, well, I don't want my kids learning about sex. They're too young. Well, they're learning about it. So you want to teach them healthy sex ed. So yeah, the pornography is a huge issue with phones and iPads and the computers. It's everywhere. Okay, so parental supervision mm -hmm. is so important. I often say you have to be your child's frontal lobes until they're exactly. developed, and, and they don't develop true. until 
fully until they're 25, right? right? So supervision, yeah. which is why I'm also sort of not a fan of sending 18 year olds away, a long ways away to school, mm -hmm. because as you and I both see, that's often when the first major psychiatric crisis happens. It's mm -hmm. the first suicide attempt, the first psychotic break, the first manic episode. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. when they're away and not being supervised, and often they've unleashed a trigger, of, a, a torrent of bad behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, from food, not sleeping, crazy relationships, and so on. Exactly. Well, these parental controls can also be so helpful on the social media sites, on the Facebook, monitoring, not letting your kids who are too young be on Facebook, even talking, talking to your kids of whether they should even be on it. Um, there are some messaging devices that just delete texts after they're sent. So parents can't really monitor what their kids are sending because they automatically delete. Right, it may not be the best idea yeah. for young kids. So, And how about for older people? I mean, I don't know if you've had sessions where you actually have to tell your patients to, you need to put down your phone. This is our time. You need to I, put down your phone. It, baffles me that someone will come in and pay money to sit in front of me to discuss life with me, to hear what I have to say, and take a phone call, read an email, or text in the middle of that session, or check Facebook. Oh, just a minute. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> um, but it follows people. That's just a great example of how it follows people everywhere, um, adults included. and. Um, so the addiction principles would be, the addiction treatment principles applied to social media would be what? So the first thing I would say, because people, a lot of people say they're not addicted. So you have to look at the social media use and say, is this a problem? Is this getting in the way with your sleep? Are you staying up later because you're on your phone or your iPad? Is this getting in the way of work? your productivity um, or relationships. So I used to have an assistant who's no longer here, who every time I'd come in to ask for help with something was on a dating app, swiping left and right. And I just said, excuse me, I'm over here. You know, I need this email sent or can you fax this or have you made this phone call yet? Um, so it, it, it just kind of comes in everywhere. So is it getting in the way with that? Um, so Last that's one of the definitions of addiction. If you do something exactly. and it interferes with your life and your health, your relationships, your work, your money with the law. Well, relationships. And you do it again. Yeah. Um, that's what we think of exactly. as an addiction. That's when it becomes an addiction. Walk into a restaurant. Look around you. How many times have you seen entire families all looking down at their phones? They're not interacting. So when we say, is this getting in the way of socializing? Is this, is your social media getting in the way of you actually being social? It, it shifts people from this world of reality into this world of fantasy, where we just kind of are biding time in real life, just waiting to get back to this sense of, um, false sense of community online. I have so many patients who come in to see me and I ask them, well, do you have friends? Are you social? And they say, of course I have friends. Well, they only have friends online. Right. Brand new study just out yesterday. The more time you spend online, the higher you are as far as depressed, anxious, mm -hmm. and lonely. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Um, and there's other studies that show it's also associated with obesity. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you have to be careful. Yes. And, and limit times, put limits on things. Only use your social media at a certain time and put the phone away. Um, I wanted to yell at my friend the other night. I had this fabulous dinner party. I like made the table. I was cooking with friends. I mean, I went all out and this guy's checking his phone all night. And I wanted to say, be here now. Like, don't <laughs> post what you're doing. Like, just be here with us you know, making, really limiting that time. And if you can't limit that time, you need to talk to someone about it. It's an addiction. Mm -hmm. Be careful. Social media may not be, is not your friend. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Jennifer Farrell, addictionologist at Amon Clinics in Southern California. Thank you for being with us. I'm so happy to be and here with you. I'm having so much fun. Um, today we're going to talk about smoking cigarettes versus vaping mm -hmm. cigarettes. A new study found that e-cigarette use could do more harm than good by substantially increasing the number of adolescents and young adults who eventually become cigarette smokers, mm -hmm. but only marginally decrease the number of adult uh, cigarette smokers who quit. So vaping, Th that was not even a term when I was right. doing my psychiatric residency. Right, I mean, this is relatively new and we've been scrambling to get data on this for years. You know, I go to addiction medicine conferences uh, all the time. And so we're trying to get data and it's so new, it's hard to get long-term data on this. So recently it seems that we're kind of, the data is going in two directions. The study that you're referring to is looking at the population at whole, as a whole, what is e-cigarettes doing to it? And as a whole, e-cigarettes are actually, instead of decreasing smoking, overall increasing because of this effect in adolescents and young adults. They are more likely to pick up cigarette smoking starting with vaping. There is a category of adults who have been smoking for years who can use vaping as a harm reduction model. Some will get on vaping and then slowly decrease the amount of nicotine they have in their cartridges in an attempt to get off. Some people are addicted to the nicotine, but it's thought to be safer than smoking the cigarette. Because you're not inhaling as many poisons. Right. We don't, however, know the long-term effects of the propylene glycol that's used uh, in the vaping. So you have this coil that heats up and you have this chemical that takes the liquid into the vapor. And so we don't know yet what the long-term effects of that will be, but it's thought that it's, it's probably, probably safer <laughs> than the cigarette, the tobacco itself. But the problem but isn't is... isn't it true that heating it up and inhaling heated air is damaging the very sensitive lung tissue and producing oxidation in your lungs. Well, it can. And I mean, anything that you smoke is going to be heated. Right. You know, so the cigarettes burning, the pipes, the everything, you know, is having that same effect. Um, certainly, you know, smoking cessation is the safest thing to do. The problem is with the young people, um, it's become cool. And so it's hard for us old people to fight the cool. But when kids talk about vaping... I'm glad you put yourself in the same category as me, <laughs> even though I'm probably 20 years older than you. Um, Good. Well, we'll remind everyone that you're 20 years older than me. <laughs> um, but, but these kids, they have these flavored ones. And they're actually put in these little things called jewels and... They have all these names and they're colorful. So describe and they're flavored. to everybody what jewels. What is so that? they have all these different vaping pipes or vapes or whatever you call them come in different shapes and sizes. They look like candy. They're in multiple colors. I was just shocked to see this weekend. They actually have a small cartridge that looks like a USB port. And you plug it into the side of your computer. So your teacher in school thinks you just have a USB port in there. And you're actually charging it. And then you can go out and vape in between. They're flavored. They're colored. And so kids are picking up on this. And they tell people, oh, no, it's just flavors. They all contain nicotine. And so they're getting exposed. And they're getting addicted when their brains are young, when they can't really make the decisions that adults make. And they can't get off of it. And vaping can be nicotine, can also be caffeine. There, mm -hmm. I did a show with Dr. Oz where we actually did uh, a quantitative EEG on him before and then while he was vaping caffeine. How interesting. It was really interesting. And mm -hmm. his visual cortex lit up and his thoughtful cortex went down. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I described it to him, you'll see the cute assistant at work and you're much more likely to make a bad decision with her. <laughs> that could cost you a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, gosh, there's just so many ways to poison ourselves, isn't mm -hmm. there? This is true. And what do you think's an effective prevention model? 
for these kids. So, mm-hmm. you know, they well, found actually that D.A.R.E. didn't work in school. It's no, it scaring. actually increased the rates of substance use, and they didn't want to talk about that because that was bad PR. But some studies showed actually increased rates of substance use for kids who had gone through the D.A.R.E. program um, compared to their peers who hadn't. When we look at young people who smoke, we're looking at peers and what their peers are doing, and we're looking at a group of people who frequently want to feel that they're in opposition to authority or their parents, they're kind of independent, making their own roles. So addressing those things is key. How do we get our kids in with healthy peers? How do we encourage healthy peer networks? And then when our kids feel that they need to rebel, how do we give them decision-making abilities that don't involve drugs or nicotine um, or too much caffeine? So having conversations with them is very helpful. While we're kind of on that uh, line of thinking, there actually are a few websites that could be helpful. If anyone has kids who are struggling with uh, using these vapes or cigarette smoking, one is called, um, the website is the84.org, and it's the number 84 the84.org, and this is a teen-driven website that's an anti-smoking, um, and so it's young people reaching out to young people, um, and so that's a great resource. There's also an app called Quit Start, um, and it's a free app that you can download to a smartphone, and it's geared towards teens. So there are some specific resources, and then NIDA also has the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, has some resources for teens as well who want to quit. Prevention is the best. Um, so and we also have our high school course, Brain Thrive by 25, which mm-hmm. actually we give away to people. It's 12 weeks, 24 hours. You can get three college units of credit. There's a awesome. charge for that. Um, but, I mean, I get three college units of credit. Mm-hmm. And we had an independent group from us study it. Mm-hmm. decreased drug, alcohol, and tobacco use, decreased depression, and improved self-esteem. Because we believe it should start by falling in love with your brain and then mm-hmm. asking yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? Mm-hmm. So not telling kids, bad, 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 you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but rather, um, your brain's involved in everything you do, how you think, how you feel, how you mm-hmm. act. It's your brain that gets you a date. It's your brain mm-hmm. that gets you into college. It's your brain that makes money. It Brain give, gets you independence with your parents or makes mm-hmm. them want to watch your every move. It's your brain. Um, and then we show them healthy scans surrounded by drug-affected scans. And we just ask the simple question, which brain do you want? Mm-hmm. And so then they really see it's not about don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. It's what do you want? Mm-hmm. Will this get you what you want? Exactly. There's so much in life to be excited about. And I talk to adolescents and college students who come to see me all the time about how exciting this stage in life really is. There's a whole world of possibilities. Smoking can be very limiting to some people. It cuts down on their brain power. Um, And, you know, people who smoke and who smell like smoke don't have the same business opportunities and um, it changes people's social networking and life can be fun. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of fun to be had. And so I think young people really need to be encouraged to, you know, hold on to their health so they can explore all these fun areas in life. So one of my favorite stories about this is there's a world famous actress, music, uh, person, singer, and uh, she and I became friends a long time ago, and she just went off the deep end, uh, Mm -hmm. smoking pot like crazy. And we published a study about a year and a half ago on a thousand pot smokers, showing every area of their brain was lower. Mm -hmm. And so I sent her the study, and she texted me back and she said, no way. And I texted her back, way. (laughs) Absolutely true. Um, And she stopped. And she actually went public with stopping. And her career has just done so much better since she stopped. And last summer, I was, uh, I spoke at the University of Massachusetts to Mm 7,000 teenagers and their parents. And she gave me permission to share the story. 
And so I text her right before my talk. I said, are you having more fun with your good habits or the bad ones? And she texted me right back and she goes, ha, good, by a billion. And that's what people don't understand. That we, we, we're not trying to deprive you of anything except dementia right. and depression right. and, depression. and <laughs> diabetes and obesity and stupidity. I mean, we want to yeah. deprive you of those. We want you to have a full, happy life when your brain works right. And how many patients, you know, maybe you can think of a patient whose brain wasn't right and the devastation. Oh, absolutely. People come into us because they're devastated. You know, people don't come in with years of heroin use happy. You know, they come in because they're absolutely miserable. The addiction takes over. Um, nicotine takes over. You aren't in control of your smoking. The smoking controls you and it dictates how long you're willing to sit on an airplane, where you're willing to go. Um, I've had patients on cannabis and they said, oh, my whole family's going to Mexico, but I can't go because I can't take my weed. Okay, let's have a discussion <laughs> about this. <laughs> it limits them. Absolutely. Have you had the discussion where people say they feel more creative when they are... Mm -hmm smoking dope or yes. doing mushrooms. What, what no. do you say? Well, so some people can be creative and that's great. Um, but a lot of times people think they're being creative. So I say, okay, if you're going to work when you're high, then I want you to sit down when you aren't and let's go over that work that you did. Let's look at that paper you wrote. Let's listen to that song you wrote. Let's watch that video clip you produced for your, you know, theater class. Let's take a look at that and see, because a lot of times, you know, when people are high, they feel like they're geniuses. <laughs> um, and when they sit down and look at it, they realize it's sloppy. They're not on point um, and they're not really conveying the best of themselves. Yeah, I know a lot of my ADD patients when they say, oh, well, I don't ever want to take medicine because I don't want to be someone different. And my response is, well, don't you want to be who you are when your brain works right? And, and the problem it's true with some psychiatric meds and a lot of the substances of abuse is they change your brain mm -hmm. in an insidious way in that they require your, mm -hmm. they will make it so they will require your brain to need that substance in order for you to feel normal, right? right? So after people get over the high and they get addicted, they end up chasing not the high, they end up chasing feeling normal. Normal, exactly. And what you can see with spect imaging, when let's say cannabis, and people say, oh, it's so innocuous, there's nothing wrong with cannabis, wrong. Um, but when you look at the scans over time, what do you see? Those orbital frontal cortex, that frontal lobe is shutting down. So yes, you may be more creative today, but guess what, long-term use, you lose motivation, you become more lethargic, you lose your drive, um, and that's you know why they used to call it dope. Now heroin's dope. It gets very confusing keeping up with all of this. <laughs> um, but it over time, it actually erodes that part of the brain that has to do with planning, motivation, judgment. And so over time, it really does a lot more harm than good. Well, wow. it's been such a joy to have you with us. We will Thanks have you back, me. as always. Stay with us. You're listening to The Brand Warrior's Way. Use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amonclinics.com or on our supplements at brainmdhealth.com. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. Go to iTunes and leave a review and you'll automatically be entered into a drawing to get a free signed copy of the Brain Warrior's Way and the Brain Warrior's Way cookbook we give away every month.